connection to slavery and to the knowledge that African ancestors brought here. They had this amazing knowledge, and it is your ancestors, and it's Bill's ancestors. So when it gets to the hue that you feel really connected with, then you stop. Um, that was a snippet for those of you that didn't see the documentary Every Fiber by uh, filmmaker Thomas Sawyer. That was just a little snippet um, of, of me working with the Indigo on many of the pieces that you saw out in the exhibition. And, um, and the songwriter, Madeline, thank you, uh, is from Nashville and wrote that beautiful song. So I just wanted to give you... I can't remember her last name. You want me to go? Okay, me? You. Okay. You go. <laughs> we had this all planned out, really. We really did. Perfect. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. I love doing these more intimate events like this where we can share a more in depth um, view into my work, the materials I use, and today, of course, it's revolving around indigo, which um, was very meaningful for me to use um, in this collection because uh, it was really inspired by my husband. Um, <laughs> um, inspired by my husband, who's an aviator. He's an African-American um, aviator. And um, I really wanted to honor him, his ancestors, and my own ancestors through this beautiful blue. And Marlies, who really knows all about it, will really go into the history. So. OK. so. Um, I was very excited to come in and do this with Celeste. I had the pleasure of doing a class with her well, three years ago now, and she was just delightful to work with. So I was very excited and honored to come do this. And what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this talk was what I really like about Celeste and her work is how thoughtful you are and how holistically you approach all the different materials. So I tried very hard to honor that and sort of holistically approach indigo for you. So you're going to get a little bit of everything. Um, I'm just going to hope that it's up on the screen, Wyatt. <laughs> JK, hold on. And then I'll just, um, I, I, you'll find as you look at the presentation that I like words. I like them. You're going to hear that a lot. And there's a lot up there. And uh, so you can either sit back, relax, and listen, or you can read, or you can just sit there and go, oh, all the words. So. However you want to do it. Um, but so I, I'll also have some visuals. Yes. You so will be don't fine. read. Don't read. Um, well, yeah, while you're Listen, playing stuff, used, I'll be like, I dipping. am used to students at 8 AM. My standards are low. All right, so, <laughs> so the thing I wanted to start off with Indigo first is just sort of talk a little bit about what the general color psychology around blue is. Because blue is one of those colors that is statistically cited probably at least 50% of the time by most people as being their favorite color. This used to be an even higher number. When they first started doing market research in the 1890s, a good, a good 50 to 75% of people remarked blue as their favorite color. So the thing is, though, is blue as a favorite color is fairly new. And understand that I'm a historian, so new to me is several centuries. But um, so once upon a time, when it first started being into the European market, and I will hit other markets in a moment. Um, it was mostly used uh, in Celtic and Germanic traditions, um, but they used woad. And woad is a different plant that grows native to most of Europe. Um, if you don't know, and we're gonna, I'm going to really beat this home, 
uh, indigo does not grow in Europe naturally, or really even if they try to force it, not the best environment. Um, so they didn't even know about it. So they're going to use woad. But the practice is going to die out. Um, they're going to turn to other colors for many various reasons. Um, but it's going to come back in the Carolingian period. The other thing about blue is it didn't really have any symbolic value. Um, it wasn't attached to anything. For example, the color red has a very deep history of being attached to being aggressive. Um, for instance, a lot of Trojan warriors would dye their leather armor red so you couldn't see when they were bleeding. So they looked invincible. You know, there's baggage with the color red. So blue doesn't have that baggage. So it really didn't have any sort of like symbolism. People didn't see blue and go, ah, the war, or whatever. So however, that changes in the 12th century when you start to get, you're leading into the Renaissance, you're not quite there, but you're starting. And you see it over and over being used to depict Mary, the Virgin Mother. So it becomes this sort of like motherly, ethereal, sort of calming color. And that's where that starts. And this is also the same time when we get the idea of a royal blue. And if you're curious about where that comes from, oh, I have not like signaled to you to change slides now. Um, I'm fine. Uh, you should hopefully be seeing a uh, 1470 um, painting that's up at the Cleveland Museum of Art in the coat of arms for the Capetian kings of France, fleur -de -lis. So that coat of arms is actually the first major European coat of arms that features this deep color blue. And it gets attached to the royal families of France for pretty much the rest of the time that they're in power. In fact, that color is still associated with a lot of um, France's national symbols and symbolism to this day. And so this was the first time you saw that color really used on a coat of arms. You used to see a lot of gold, a lot of red, because again, men. And so you saw different things, you know, your heraldic sort of like rampant lions, and then also, oddly, the unicorn. Um, so this is the first time you start to see it really being used extensively in art. And one of the reasons that is, is you start to get sort of these indigo pigments available to these artists through the major trade routes. They're going through the Silk Road and around the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and get, those are coming into, into an availability area. So, um, I know it's very subtle, my signals. Um, the interesting thing about the color blue, though, is it was typically worn most often by working class people. And you can kind of see this here. So the picture on the left is going to be from a book of hours. It's actually the, the rich hours for the Duc de Berry. It's the most famous one. Um, and you see there are peasant workers in the field. So this is still under the feudal system. And most of them are wearing, you typically would see a color closer to like a chambray denim color. Um, because again, you're wearing heavy wool fabrics, heavy chambray fabrics that can put up with the physical labor you're doing in them. Um, and you can see also in the peasant wedding, a lot of blues in there. So it's something that wasn't typically worn necessarily by people of the upper class. Blue was very much a universal color. Um, so in terms of psychology of blue, see I told you about the words. So blue has a calming effect. So when they do studies about it, it actually, if people sit in a blue room or stare at like a, soft, a nice deep blue color, your heart rate actually um, will slow down, your respiration rate will slow down, your blood pressure will go down. So we associate it with harmony, we associate it with peacefulness. It's one of the reasons they like, a lot of people recommend painting your child's room blue when they're a baby. Um, yeah, don't paint that infant's room yellow, that is, oh mistakes were made. So contrary to associating blue as a relaxing and tranquil color, its popularity is actually due to the fact that it's non-offensive. It's almost beige in its emotional. <laughs> it's like the beige of favorite colors. You're like, I love blue. And you're like, ah, you love to not feel things. Like that's, which blue is my favorite color. So I am being facetious. But and my, and my name means blue in Spanish. Oh, well, see, now I've, I've really beige. stuck my foot I'm like, in just it. beige. You're very beige. I've always thought that about you. Very one-dimensional. So, you know, so there's this whole thing from uh, this color, this psychologist who studied color. And it's sort of saying that, like, when you say your favorite color is blue, you're not revealing too much about yourself. And if you think about that, that's actually true. As opposed to, you're much more struck, I think, if you ask someone their favorite color and they're like, orange. You're like, oh, you're interesting. Why? You know? So you sort of have that. And it's not to say those favorite colors can't be anything else. But it's interesting, too, that blue has maintained that color association over hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, other cultural meanings for blue, because that's generally like the European, North Could American. Could you switch? Could you switch for me? I'm terrible at this. I'll, maybe I'll switch. 
you're on top of it. Um, so blue doesn't have the same cultural meaning. It doesn't have those ties to the Virgin Mary iconography. It doesn't have sort of like, oh, blue is calming. But it does have associations with uh, peasant clothing and working clothing because they primarily used indigo to dye their clothing. Um, in China, it was associated with peasant farmers. But also, interestingly, it was the color used um, almost like a uniform for uh, the Qing Dynasty um, imperial officials' robes. If you've ever seen the big dragon robes of the gold embroidered dragon, those are all blue. Um, but Marlies, yes, this is ridiculous. I'm gonna hold it. You do you. Uh, um, also, isn't that where, like, the working class wore blue? Isn't that where we get blue collar workers? Oh, the, the phrase, look at blue you! Collar. It is indeed. It is indeed. Isn't because that, you got a blue collar. Isn't that funny? We use that term all the time, and it's from indigo. Do you know why it's a white collar if you work like in an office? It's because you don't get dirty. You can wear a white collar. And you can afford to do laundry to keep that collar white. I didn't know that. So you bougie. <laughs> so. <laughs> you see why I loved working with Marlies? She's hilarious. So the other thing that happens is you sort of get this uniform. And I think now we sort of think of it as a Mao suit, but it really started before Mao's time. But it sort of becomes this almost uniform in China um, when it's first being uh, founded as a republic under Sun Yat-sen. Um, it's that four button, you know, short collar, uh, four pocket um, thing. I got you. Okay. I'm enjoying this. I'm so Keep beige. Talking. You're good. So if you want to switch for me, it is your beige. Oh, is what beige? actually is indigo? I know when you came here, like, I hope there's textile science. You're in luck. <laughs> Strap in, it's happening. Um, so if you could go to the next one. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So there's actually a lot of different indigo plants. There's not just one. But the one that most people prefer, she's got her baby plant, is actually Indigofera tinctura. And it, it literally is sort of Latin for like the dying indigo plant, the plant and used that, for dying. And that's what this is, indigofera Oh, you got tinctura. the good one. And, and her name is Laurel. Aww. And it's named after Ray Ray's mom, Laurel. So. But I think there are quite a few of them because Laurel She's hilarious too, so there's a lot of laughter and I stuff. I like it. Yeah. That's Sorry. excellent. The plant, when they get full grown, she's a baby, mm -hmm. can be about four or five feet tall. And they actually produce a flower, if you can see in the picture, um, that's more like a purple pink color. It's not blue. Um, it's really interesting because I think the assumption is, is like, oh, it must be a blue plant. And it is not at all. You have to do a lot of work to get to that blue. It does not just happen. Um, they are more indigenous to India, China, Indonesia, parts of Africa, and South America. So they do not naturally grow in North America or in Europe, where the people wanted it. So if you could go to the next one. In terms of extraction, there's a lot of different processes and a lot of different ways that you can get to the dye. But they all kind of follow a similar process. Um, the plant doesn't produce it ready-made, right? It's not like, uh, if you're familiar with cochineal, Cochineal was the other big dye crop, if you will, that went, they went crazy for in the New World. Cochineal is actually like a, a little insect that um, you harvest off a certain species of cactus and then grind into a paste. And it, I know. And it makes the most beautiful red. It makes beautiful red. And before that, all European had was matter red, which was a root, which was cool. But then they were like, oh, that red sucks, because we found this one. And part of the big reason the Spaniards colonized a lot of middle and upper South America was to get to the cochineal. But I digress. <laughs> I digress a lot, friends. It's happening. Um, so when you, subject, when you start to ferment parts of the indigo plant, um, there's an enzyme that breaks down, um, particularly in the leaves, that starts to produce that indigo dye. But once again, it's still not ready. Um, that product that happens is not actually soluble in water. So if you add water and make an aqueous solution that you normally would to dye things to make a dye bath, you can't just add this. You have to add an alkaline of some kind. And fun fact number one, it just used to be urine. That was someone's job, friends, <laughs> collecting it. <laughs> Yeah, in Pompeii, there was a whole area where it was just urine collecting. Yep, it was a job. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. I didn't, I didn't pee in this bath. <laughs> well, the better, the other part of that story is a lot of time how you mixed it was to walk in it. Yeah. So Celeste doesn't go quite that au naturel. Um, I might, maybe in the future. You, I, if you do, I want a phone call. So what? 
<laughs> so what actually happens is then that dye then becomes soluble. You put your, your fiber or your entire garment or your fabric in the dye bath at that time. And then when you take it out, it oxidizes, it turns that deep blue, and it sets in the fibers. And it's really strong. Have you ever heard the phrase dyed in the wool? This is what this means. It means it's such a strong substantive dye that once it's in there and oxidizes, it's stuck that color. Your true blue, you're in it. And, it, and when you put it in, the vat looks sort of murky yellow green. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see as I take this out, it will look green. But as soon as it starts oxidizing, it will turn blue. So the more I let the oxygen move into it, the yeah, more so blue can, it becomes. Yeah, you can see where it's still folded. It's a little bit green, and it's going to get more blue. And it gets indigo. Um, a lot of people think that if you just leave it in for a long time, that that makes a deeper color. But it's actually just how many times you dip it in, because it needs the oxygen to work to create the blue. So if I dip it in again, you'll notice that it's a little bit of a deeper blue. Yeah. Also, oh, sorry, oh sorry, and we'll have a chance if anyone wants to try this, and please come talk to my vet because it really likes to be talked to, and also to the plant, to Laurel. If you can talk to Laurel too, please. Or me. Nothing but good things. <laughs> no yelling at Laurel. <laughs> See, look at the blue. Why, if you can go to the next one for me. So at the height of sort of when I get into the history here of, of the indigo trade, um, there were different varieties of indigo, um, and these are sort of like, they were basically given names based on where they were grown in terms of what was most desirable for dye merchants and um, uh, cloth manufacturers. The, the number one was Bengal indigo. This comes from different districts in Bengal. It was considered the best. Um, the Indonesian variety was Java. Uh, it was considered very good, but it was preferred specifically for dyeing cotton. Uh, the Bengal is something you'd maybe try to pick up if you were dyeing silk. Um, the Chinese indigo is, I think, just as good. But what's interesting about the Chinese indigo is typically when you would export indigo, it would come in like almost like little cakes, if you will, like little kind of bar, big soap bar looking things. Um, and the Chinese, actually, when they produce it and manufacture it, it comes out in thin little sheets. So some people just didn't quite know how to deal with that. So it was just that was part of that issue. Um, there's the Guatemala. Guatemala is really great as well, and it was nicer for trade up into uh, the US and the Caribbean because it was closer, so it's going to reduce the cost. Um, but the other thing there, too, is they're mostly producing less uniform shapes. It's just sort of irregular sizes as it comes out of the vat and they dry it and press it. I'm not going to quite get into that deep level for you because I, I have sympathy for you eventually. Um, there's the Manila indigo, um, which I am so sorry was considered the worst. <laughs> um, it was, I'm real sorry. It's a little beige. <laughs> it was, it's interesting. It still worked really well, but it, it, just, um, I, it just was processed and ended up having a lot of earth and lime still in it. So it just didn't have the level of refinement um, because they just, I think for traditional practices, it wasn't as necessary. Mm -hmm. And they weren't exporting it. It wasn't really until they started to be colonized by the Dutch and having the Dutch com trading company start to, to send that out that it mattered. Mm. Okay, so really, to the indigenous people, is fine, yeah. but you know, to like again, bougie merchants. <laughs> um, so one of the things they did, and you'll love this, it basically only got exported to us and not Europe, because we low class. If you didn't know, and um, Manila in the Philippines is our capital, and we say Manila, and it means where indigo is from. So, yeah. I know. I feel like we need that like doo 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 rainbow every time. <laughs> and the last is the um, they kind of group together the African uh, West African Senegal Nigeria um, indigo in with Egypt. They are different, but you know for we're, we're talking like 18th century Dutch merchants, so white Europeans, and they're like ah you're all the same. So it's it's racist. It's what they did. <laughs> Um, so the quality varied, but it could be very good. And you have to think about the fact that um, ancient Egypt was using indigo forever. Um, you can find extant examples now that are thousands and thousands of years old. Um, but the problem was is they assumed, because it came from Africa, it wasn't any good. So they didn't try to export it much. They're wrong. 
it was excellent, but they were like, eh. Plus, they were a little busy taking something else from Africa at that time. <laughs> we're going to talk about it. <laughs> All right, if you can go to the next one for me. So what's the difference between woad and indigo? So I mentioned earlier that woad is what Europe had. Woad grows everywhere. You know, like you know, throw a rock and there it is. Like it's everywhere. And it also does not look like it would produce a blue dye. It's, it's a yellow plant. Um, indigo was the principal dye of Asian cultures because indigo grew native. Woad is what was sort of indigenous to Europe. Um, European dye is made from woad. Uh, it has a blue green color through the stems and leaves and it has those bright yellow flowers. Um, the thing about indigo that makes it better than woad is uh, indigo is the only sort of naturally occurring substance in dye. And what I mean by that is it, it will dye both vegetable and animal fibers equally well. So it can dye leather just as deep as it can dye cotton, as deep as it can dye uh, silk. You have a lot of trouble with woad trying to get that deep a color on something like a leather or an animal fiber. Um, it also produces, in my opinion, a much more vibrant shade um, than you get with woad as well. The dye from woad is, is less concentrated, so you have to have a lot more of it. And it also can tend to produce a, a color at the end of the day that has a little bit of a greenish tinge. The other thing it does is it starts to break down the fibers, so your fabric is less likely to last over time, whereas indigo is not going to do that. It's one of the principal reasons we use it in denim and jeans is because you're going to wear the idea behind jeans originally was that they were work pants and you wanted them to hold up. So indigo was great because it wasn't going to already start to damage those fibers before you even put them on. Okay, that was the idea. And what she was saying with the like sub the um, multiple baths when you get those super dark jeans, they've been dipped so many times that there's now have you ever noticed where it sloughs off on your hands? Cuz there's so much in it. The fibers are like, I can't take it anymore. And they're losing it. If you want to go to the next one, I can't talk about indigo, and one of the reasons I like your work is you thought about this, is there's a real human cost to indigo. Um, it, you know, particularly, it's one of those crops and, and products that was a huge part of the slave trade that we don't necessarily learn about when we're in school, because one of the things we learn about with the South here in the US is the idea of cotton. Cotton was king. Yeah, indigo was first. This was the big, this was the, really the driver for a lot of the, the um, import of slaves into the South. You can go to the next one for me. So there's sort of this colloquial oral history in South Carolina about this woman named Eliza Lewis, Lucas Pinckney, I always want to call her Lewis, um, for saving the economy of the South at, in the mid 18th century. And that's a delightful story. And she did sort of, because she owned other people, New stuff. So how that went is indigo is something they tried to grow here when they started the colonies almost immediately. Because the colonies were, were what? They were just supposed to be essentially a place to grow crops and cash crops to make money for, the, for queen and country or king at that period in time, right? Um, so they tried to grow a lot of different crops. Uh, Virginia ended up with tobacco, good soil for that, worked out. You know, they got up in New York, not so good for the growing, but we did the merchant thing, so it was okay. And they got down into South Carolina, and they were like, wow, it's real marshy here, and humid, and wet, and low. And so they were like, ah, rice. So they started growing rice. Rice was not super duper popular in Europe, um, so it wasn't making a lot of money. So they were like, how can we make more money? So here comes this 16-year-old girl, Eliza, sent from her father in Antigua to go manage the plantations in the low country of South Carolina outside of Charleston. Now, he was a botanist, and she had interest in botany. Credit where credit is due. She liked to read books. Now, what she did was she thought, ooh, if we could get indigo to grow here, that'd be great. She had no idea how to do that. Let's be square. They, we traced it back to probably be um, this one male slave of the families that came directly from West Africa and had worked with it at home before being forced to move. Um, so what's going on there is he probably figured out how to get it to grow. Because if you don't know about growing indigo, you have to you gotta talk to that plant. You got to coax it through the cold months. You got to help it. You got to be nice to it. And then when you have to process it, you got to keep the anger inside because it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to do. You don't just like wing it. You don't just you're like, I'm going to grow indigo and I'm going to die stuff. You're like, OK. Um, it didn't work out. So 
Basically, it took off with all of the planters, and here's why it's kind of terrible. They had been wondering for a while, what should I do with my slaves in the off season? I don't want them to just sit around, because that'd be terrible. And they also were making them grow their own food. But they were like, oh, you know what they can do? Because the growing seasons complement each other, I'm going to have them grow indigo. And indigo could grow on those slightly drier, higher places in South Carolina, and it took off. So much so that Georgia got into the indigo game. And they, did you know slavery was originally illegal in Georgia? I know, I too was shocked. Because you think Georgia, and you're like, meh, slavery. No, they, were, they enacted slavery in Georgia in 1751 because they need more people to work the indigo plantations. That is why. So that is what happened there. Um, and again, there's a, the story of Eliza is lovely. And there's this whole, her husband wrote these beautiful articles in newspapers about all of her work. And this is her process, and blah, blah, blah. And everybody was like, oh. And I'm like, that, I'm sorry. That white woman is not out in the fields growing anything. But she's like, she's a good, she sold stuff. She's good at marketing. Do your thing, girl. And Marlise also, I mean, because there was such demand coming from England for this beautiful blue mm -hmm. color, it just increased the, the trade slave. Right? Yes. So it just, we just needed more slaves. And I, I find it ironic that England is sort of like, well, we were anti slavery much earlier than the US, yet they were really influencing the, the, um, the really enormous amounts of slaves that we needed more and more because just to fill their, fill their need for this blue dye. Yeah, the blue dye was so popular. If you can change it for me, I have some examples of um, European fashion from around this period, so about mid, mid 18th century. She's going to introduce, she, you just go with me on this one. She's going to introduce indigo to South Carolina in 17, six, 50, 51 or 61, I apologize. Basically in the middle of the century. And it is extremely popular. And England is in love with us producing it because they get it on the cheap, right? Because they own us. So it's super cheap for them. And it's really popular. And it takes off. And everybody wants to be wearing indigo. So it does speed up the slave trade. Um, where they're importing more and more slaves to deal with not just their sugar plantations um, in the Caribbean and parts of Florida, but also uh, mostly the indigo, indigo plantations up in the American South. It's not going to flip to cotton until after this market for indigo collapses after the American Revolution. That cotton comes later. Cotton comes on the heels of the industrialization of processing cotton, so the cotton gin, the spinning jenny, um, mechanized looms. That makes cotton more uh, uh, profitable. Sorry, I couldn't find the word. Mm -hmm. You can switch it for me. I actually want to talk about the collapse of American indigo. And I'm going to come back to the British being like, oh, we got rid of slavery. Yeah, you exported it. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened. After the Revolutionary War, um, the price of American indigo drops through the floor. Okay, And that's because all of a sudden, Britain, who is the number one buyer of that product, has to pay taxes on it, right? Export taxes, American prices, blah, 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 because we're now our own country. And that's also to add to the fact that they're slightly bitter about the fact that we're our own country, because they've lost out on this pipeline of material. Okay, So basically, they stop purchasing the indigo, and American growers really back away from it because it's not making them the money that it used to. And that's when you're going to start seeing the, the crossover to cotton. But what they do is they don't give up on producing indigo. They move it to a new colony. They move it to India. And no, they don't own slaves in India, but I'm going to explain to you the process, and it's essentially the same. Okay, So they're like, we had lots of slavery in 1808. I'm like, OK. And you need a lot of indigo to, oh, yeah. to create the, you know, like this little laurel here um, will eventually turn into a composted type of you know, the leaves will be composted and it can probably dye a very weak, you know, maybe a whole scarf, but a, in a very weak blue, um, probably very light like this here. Yeah. So you need a lot of it to create the pigment. Oops. It's cool. We got too close. It's fine. Okay. This is my social distancing. <laughs> the mic says you're too close. You can go to the next one for me. So I want to explain the process of what that looked like in India. And it was known as the Rioti system. And it's in reference to the peasant farmers. They're known as Rioti. And what would happen is British planters would compel. And I use that on purpose. They compelled, meaning they threatened. They maimed and beat people up. They killed um, farm animals. 
um, they killed family members. So when I say compel, I mean it. They compelled peasant farmers to sign a contract to grow indigo. Here's why um, on a certain portion of their land. So the Rio T, much like slavery, did not own their land. They're renting it from a local landholder called a Zaminder. A Zamindar was really working with the British, right? Because you're that sort of intermediary, almost landed gentry kind of person, right? So what they're doing is in order to grow those crops and, pay, and also pay for the rent on the land, they have so little money that they're taking loans out from the Zamindars to pay for their yearly rent, okay? Now, they're then being forced by the British to grow this indigo, and they're paid way below market value. I'm talking 2.5% of market value, okay, for this crop that they're producing. And they've given up the land to grow food on, because they also are supposed to use this land to grow their own food. So now they don't have enough money to pay back the zamindar, and so now they're indebted to them, and they have to keep going. Do you see the cycle? Where you have to just keep going, because the zamindar will be like, we'll grow more indigo so I can sell it. And you get stuck in this cycle. So no, it's not slavery, but it's slavery. Okay, and their debts are inherited. It's not like if you died, your family got out of it. No, your debts passed from father to son to wife, whoever was still living. So you just got stuck on that land growing these things. Um, so it's really pretty terrible, pretty terrible. I like to tell uplifting stories. So if you can go to the next one for me, I just have some images. Now these images are gonna be later, but they're from a British photographer who went out to India, uh, I think closer to 1877. But the process of how this was done is, is in terms of harvesting, is not going to change. You can go to the next one for me. And go to the next one. If you've never heard of the Indigo Revolt, it is excellent. So the rebellion's going to start in 1859. And it's going to start in the village of Bengal. And basically, all of the villagers there were like, enough. We're not growing it anymore. We're not growing this indigo anymore. We refuse. It started off peaceful, OK, and got violent. Because the, Brit the Zamindars and the British, which the British will tell you, wasn't us, it was the local people. Where'd they get the guns? No one needs to know. Look over here. So basically, they start attacking the planters, or, or the farmers, excuse me. So the farmers start to fight back. And they're super organized. They did not see that coming. Like, they'd wa they talked to each other, they worked together, everybody was in on it, mom, grandma, anyone, shovels, whatever you got, and they really took it to them, which, bravo. Because, um, like, yeah. And they basically, it got back to the British, the British government heard about this, and they were like, oh, we had no idea. And you're like, okay. Plausible deniability, friends. They were like, we have no idea. We're gonna get a commission, which is also like, the most academic response to it ever. They're like, we're going to get a commission. We're going to get a group out there, and they're going to look at it. And you're like, oh, Lord. It actually worked out. The commission actually came back, which good for them. And we're like, hey, man, this is terrible. These people can't eat. Your people are awful. And they were like, oh, no. We should fix that. And you're like, oh, OK. Um, so they actually did. They actually made a lot of policy changes. And, and did it perfect the system? No. Were there so many other problems with the British rule in India that this was like a drop in the bucket? Yes. Um, but it's also interesting, because this is also one of the very first campaigns that Gandhi participated in. Was, um, uh, it was about a specific region in Bihar. Um, he participated in some nonviolent protests there for the production of indigo with these farmers. So it is something that is deeply part of the culture there. Um, indigo is very important. It's an important dye. And it's also sort of very symbolic of the ongoing issues of the relationship of British colonization. I think it's also one of those memorable images of Gandhi where he's all in white, and it's very mindful. Like, he's just being intentional about not being in, in indigo-dyed cloth. Yep. And it, he's like, it's a really famous picture of him, and he's just all in white. And that was his protest. Yeah. And there's a really, you know, and I wish I had all of the time because I, I don't even have a chance to talk to you about how important indigo was to indigenous populations here in terms of like um, trade goods and, and getting that fabric from, from Europe for the indigenous populations here, and what happened when you started to force those people out for the indigo plantation for the land. So it's a, there's so much, there's so much, y'all. I can't. 
Um, if we can go to the next one, I do want to talk about why indigo declines, and it's because we finally came up with synthetic dye, and it's a great story. Okay, so go to the next one. There's this guy. His name is William Perkins, and he's, I'm going to call him a middle-of-the-road British chemist, okay? And what he's trying to do in 1856 is come up with a synthetic quinine. He's not trying to come up with a synthetic dye. He's trying to come up with a synthetic quinine related to all of the British colonization in India because a lot of their soldiers are dying of malaria. And they're trying to come up with a synthetic way to vaccinate in the simplest way against malaria and to treat malaria. And so he's trying to come up with a synthetic quinine. He's terrible at it. He did a terrible job. Mm -mm. Missed the boat by 10 million. But what he did do when he was cleaning up his lab afterwards, he noticed that his jacket and his cloth were all dyed this really deep purple color. And he went, huh, how'd that happen? If you don't know about purple, purple was the most exclusive and expensive color until this exact moment. Because purple is made by taking a snail shell, a mollusk, that's about yay big, and grinding it up and processing it into a dye. Do you know how many of these bad boys you need to get out of the sea and grind up? There were sumptuary laws about it. People were like, only the super fancy can wear purple. If you try to wear purple and you ain't fancy, we're going to put you in jail because you are you know, above your station, blah, 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 blah. So nobody had been able to wear purple. Well, when I tell you that when this hit the market, people, and forgive my language, lost their minds. <laughs> they lost their minds. They were like, oh, I can wear purple. I'm like royalty. I am the queen. They were losing it. It's so popular that newspapers called it the mauve measles. They were like, everyone has the mauve measles. And when they say mauve, they mean this exact shade of purple, OK? Everyone had this shade of purple, everyone. Because they were like, look, look, Gertrude, I am fancy. And they're like, oh, Beatrice, I too am fancy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Estelle, you're, fa you're fancy as well. We shall go be fancy together. And you know, so that's how that worked out. So, And the Philippines were probably saying fancy. Fancy. We're fancy. Fancy. Yeah. The, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fancy beige. You're a fancy beige. <laughs> so one of the things that's really fun about that, by the way, is he took this idea to the British Association of Chemists, and they were like, ugh, that's so plebeian. You want to sell that for money? Meanwhile, the Germans were like, we'll take you. They owned the market until the collapse of Germany after World War I. They owned every single patent on synthetic dyes. And then the British were like, oh, and we're like, yeah. But though they were above that. They're like, we, we're into science. And he was like, peace, y'all. And he went to Germany. So the preparation of the dye, it's a lot less labor intensive. It's a lot cheaper. People were loving it. Did it also cause the cancer when you processed it? Yes. But that was for low class people. No problem. I don't have time for labor laws. All right, we can go to the next one. I am going to talk a little bit about different techniques for indigo around the world. So if I go to the next one, and you are going to be excellent and show all these different techniques, because she knows how to do them. So one of the most uh, popular methods of dealing with indigo is to work in a resist paste. Um, so there's different versions of this uh, around the world, and I'll touch on a couple of them. But basically, it's the production of any design by using a resist paste. Um, there are two methods. You can print or paint. It's kind of hard to see there. She's going to pull it up. You'll see it when she pulls it out of yeah, the Yeah, you'll see it. And thank you to Redima for doing yeah. this um, fatigue. And so what it does is you paint some sort of resist, and I'll talk about the different ones across cultures, and it prevents the dye from attaching in those areas that you print or draw. And you can see the green because this is a different fab. This is a silk fabric, but yeah. this is a Habutai, it's a little thicker than the, this silk. So you can see that this is quite green, but if I keep doing this, it will turn blue. The other method, if you think of it more like a bleaching, is to essentially uh, paint on with a bleaching agent and take the dye away. This is the more popular method. Can you see that? Can you kind of see it? Yeah. OK, cool. It's and see how it's more blue now? Too? Yeah. With a little bit of oxygen. Um, this, is, this was done by stamping. So we use the stamped with the, with the wax for this resist um, pattern, which we do a lot. Oh, you're probably going to go over that, huh? Probably do a lot. You are never stepping on my toes, do you? <laughs> Thanks, Marlies. Um, in Asia, in India, yeah. um, Indonesia, and also in Africa, very much so in Africa. So if Beautiful. you go to the next one for me, 
Um, the traditional cloth uh, in West Africa out of the Yorubu people is going to be called a deer. Um, the basic lines of the fabric uh, are formed by folding the cotton material in, and you typically are going to leave a plain section. Um, and a lot of times when you're doing wrapped garments, uh, when you roll that plain section down, you're going to have that band of blue across the top and then the rest of the, the pattern. Um, and typically, the, the dyer will make some sort of maker's mark on that, if we want to think of it as a selvage. Um, the paste is mainly made of cassava root uh, mixed with water. Um, you could use a brush. You could use a feather. You could use a stiff leaf vein from a palm leaf. Which this was used. We use a little stick vein from a leaf. Yeah, from a vein from a leaf. So on brand. All right. And it, it's really thickly painted on. If you're doing a large piece of fabric, just applying the resist paste can take up to three days. Um, and the pattern can also be done with stencils. It's more traditionally done by hand. Um, and I have an example here that's out at the Smithsonian. And Redima drew this wonderful um, pattern, which was supposed to mimic the little um, wings of, um, of dragonflies. Oh, that's so nice. Isn't that sweet? And you see how this is now turning blue, Yeah. right? And look if you how go to the next one for me, you'll be able to see the difference here this is the same process, but out of Japan. And in Japan, it's called katazome. And it comes from the word kata, meaning a tool used to repeat a pattern or shape. And zome, which comes from another word, um, meaning to dye. And here, you're making it out of um, rice, um, rice flour paste, uh, husks, lime, salt. Um, usually, it's done through stencils. And the stencils are made by taking this very um, thick paper that you make out of a particular um, mulberry tree, um, which they have a lot of. Remember, the mulberry tree is what uh, the silkworms like, right? So it's another way to use that product. And you're, you're actually gluing and, and adhesing t um, multiple layers together, usually three or four, uh, so it's super thick. And then you're using that paper stencil to then put the design on the fabric, like what you see here in the image. So it's, you can see it's very similar, but you're going to get cultural differences. If you go to the next one. You're going to get very intricate here in Java. So the Javanese uh, batik um, is almost exclusively on cotton. Um, again, most of their things are, if you're thinking about it in terms of how the fabric's used, it's used as a wrap garment. It's, you know, cotton's more sturdy. Um, it uses a very special tool. Uh, it's essentially a wooden rod with a little metal um, bowl at the end and then various it has a little spout, and that spout can get super thin and precise, like a human hair, OK? And you apply a wax. Um, and that's why if you get up close to some of these batiks, you might see a little bit of crackle um, if you've ever done any kind of wax uh, resist dye. Um, when it starts to get mass produced, uh, that's when you start to see them move into the stamps. And they have metal stamps as well. They still do both to this day. Um, Javanese batiks typically uh, were strictly blue and white for a long time. When they got colonized by the Dutch and started exporting a lot of fabrics, they added in some other colors, primarily for actually um, the West African and European market because it was being sent to both places. So it was being bought in Africa as Didn't well. Didn't know that. Yeah, it's a weird triangle. Mm. If you go to the next one, um, the other thing that's very popular is uh, tie and dye or tie dye. Um, and that's across cultures as well. The Adir, West African, again, um, it's always cotton. It's always indigo. Traditionally, it's two lengths of seven foot long, three foot wide fabric that you then sew together and use as a wrap garment. Oh, you've got the I've got, and, and, and this is shibori. We've shibori? used some shibori get there. techniques. Oh, I'm going to okay. get to shibori. Are you, is it, should I wait? Literally the next slide. Don't wait. Don't wait. Can I go okay. to the next one? Okay. OK, so this is, this is some of the shibori techniques, and I'm going to dip it. And we also have a shibori piece where you can see um, what we've done. But we've done um, a process where we do these little spiral tips, and it ends up looking like, you'll see, it looks like uh, mosquito. I mean, no, not mosquito. What's the a little? Uh, cobwebs, thank you, cobwebs. And then we use a chopstick to, um, to sort of wrap it, and that will give sort of, it's supposed to give sort of a wood grainy effect. And then we've also sewed some aspects of it to create a resist dye. So I'll do that now while Marlene's Oh, yeah. Talks. I'll just give you a little bit more about shibori. Um, it's thought to have started much earlier. The, er the oldest existing piece comes from the 8th century. Um, again, the word comes from uh, original word yuhata, which means tie and cloth. 
Um, there's many different methods and motifs for shibori. Um, if you go to the next one for me, you can see an up close here of, of a shibori piece being prepared and then what it looks like when it's unfolded and unsewn, okay? Um, which you'll probably end up with uh, you know, similar thoughts over here. And my last one, if you'll go to the next one, is a technique, and I'm gonna jump ahead of you a little bit so don't feel mm -hmm. rushed. Yeah, I'm not into it. Is ecot. Oh, uh, ecot. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll let this take and then your I'll time. undo it. I get to talk about it for a minute. Okay, all right. So the ecot process is where you actually dye the yarns prior to weaving, and then you achieve the design on the fabric once you weave it. It's insanely difficult, and it still boggles my mind that she willingly engages in this practice. <laughs> I did it last night. I know, she's like, I'm gonna prep some ecot, and I was like, okay. Because it's really a wonderful process. You know, you take, this is just a plain old cotton yarn, which I didn't spin, it's just cotton yarn off a skein, and you bind the areas of the cotton, of the yarn, whatever your yarn is, and then when you, unbind them, so you, you dye it. This is just one dip of the indigo, um, but you can already see as I unbind that there's the resist that's happening, mm -hmm. and you end up with yarn that has these areas that are not dyed, and then when you go to do all of that, of course they're all you know um, in their little areas, and so when you go to weave it, which I wove this little piece last night, it creates a beautiful uh, pattern. Okay, it's random, but it's, it's uh, you can't, there's no other way to get this effect without no. ecot. No. And this is also very popular in the Philippines and oh, in yeah. Indonesia. And I'll, I'll for, let for, you. Oh, no. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the piece you're seeing there uh, is that's entirely done through weaving. That's entirely done through leaving, like you said, resist areas in the yarns. So those white areas are places where they didn't dye the yarn and then wove it. And what's happening there too is you have to remember if you're, if you're not familiar with weaving, if you can think back to once upon a time where you made the construction paper baskets in your primary school days, you have a set of yarns going this way, okay, that are stagnant, they aren't moving per se, and then you have a set of yarns going this way that you're going like this, okay? And how this works is this set of yarns has that resist and then you pick and choose one yarn at a time and how much you're gonna go in and out of to create something like that. Okay, if you're doing a you know a fairly basic like in over one over one or something, which is this, is fine, and that's what that's what you'll get. If you're getting something pictorial like this, you're you're there's literally like, oh, I'm going to go over five threads and then two and then five and then two, and on the next line I'm going to do da 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 da. Yeah, and you should see these people do it because me me and math we're not super tight. Okay, um, I'm a historian. I tell you about other numbers, but like. That's a level, and it's not, like if I tried to do that, I'd look at the diagram, do the thing. Other people, like traditional weavers of this, they're just like boop, 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 and it just, I'm like, ah. Oh. Okay, and when I get my last slide, this is just another example of um, one out of Indonesia and Sumatra that's completely indigo. So, um, I'll let you do that. If you guys, I don't know how you wanna do this, if you ever, want to talk to me. I'll give you a little bit of background while you untie. I got, I can I fill. don't have my glasses. You're cool, I'll fill I time. I can't see. I got stories. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, for those of you, I didn't take the time to introduce myself other than to say that I was excited to be here with Phyllis. And Phyllis. I'm sorry, I should have introduced <laughs> you. Now I got filler. Uh, so I'm a history curator over at the Ohio History Connection and I specialize in the history of uh, clothing and textiles. That is my game. I can tell you almost anything about clothing worn ever. Now, do I know all the answers? No, but I can tell you a book to look in. Um, so that's, that's really my thing. Uh, so if you ever have questions about anything related to that, I'm always happy to answer them. I have my business cards with me too, if, if that's easier than, than having that up on the screen. Um, my primary areas of research and focus are actually the last 25 years of the 19th century and talking about um, trying to reform women's fashion out of corsets and bustles and into pants. Um, if you want a spoiler alert on that story, not to reduce all of my research to one sentence, it didn't work out. <laughs> didn't work out. Turns out um, men were very intimidated by ladies in pants. Uh, we'd have too much freedom. We try to be men. Well, you know what's great about it? I'm seriously, I'm just gonna keep filling time. 
What's great about men's fear of women in pants, this is not what you came for. Um, but it's happening. And where are you going to go? It's dark. Women in pants. I mean, we're going to, that's right? great. Women in pants. Talk about women. The whole thought process is like, oh my God, they're going to become men and men are terrible. That was it. They're like, men are gross. They fight in the street. They smoke. Um, they drink too much. We don't want our women to do that. And I'm like, why are pants the gateway to that? And they're like, we don't care what you say. No pants. No pants. And they're like, if you're a man, you're going to do all these horrible things. And they're like, but maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just not have respiratory problems. And they're like, nah, <laughs> no pants. <laughs> Women actually couldn't wear pants, like, really, until like the 1940s. And even then, only in certain circumstances, primarily at home, if you could, where only your husband sees you in pants. That's important, ladies. Ankles were upsetting. <laughs> you can see ankles for a long time. Ankles are pretty upsetting. They're pretty upsetting. Um, and then speaking of pants, because of the indigo yeah. and the, and the, the blue jeans, right, and all of that, yeah. um, indigo in, in Japan, and correct me if I'm misremembering this, but I know that they used to dip their firemen's um, jackets in indigo because indigo is, is, is heat resistant. That's correct. It's also, um, it's also in, an insect repel, a natural yes. insect repellent. Yes. Can you, didn't that have to do with also the slaves? Because the slaves were dying from um, malaria. Yes. And it had a big, and they were like, oh, wait, if our slaves grow indigo and they use it for this you know, mosquito repellent, our slaves will live longer and we can use them even longer. So that was a big part of indigo as well, where they, they were able to. I don't know if you guys can see these web. It's sometimes easier to see when it dries, but. Can you see? I know it's not quite dry yet, but yeah, you can see them. Though. You can kind of—they're a little bit faint, but the darker I would have dipped, the more you would have been able to see the contrast. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? So there are all kinds of different shibori techniques, and the, the names are in Japanese that mean things like spider webs and wood mm -hmm. grain and and you know floral petals and things like that. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different shibori techniques. This is just a few. Yeah. Um, I'm good. Are you good? I'm good. I think, uh, oh, we also, we didn't really mention this part, or maybe you did and I wasn't listening. There's, we can also, with shibori, we can clamp as well. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. So this is a clamped version. Um, of shibori, and it's basically just folding it and clamping it and dipping it in certain parts. And I'm sure you've seen this before. This has become a very popular, a lot of people are giving shibori workshops, and this is kind of the thing that they're doing. So it's a very popular um, way to use shibori as well. And then we do have, for anyone interested, um, you know, we do have some silks up here. We have some pre um, batik things like what I dipped in. If, you're, if you'd like to dip, as you can see, you will get blue hands unless you <laughs> keep your hands out of the vat, which is OK, too. Um, with indigo, uh, because the, the vats are really sacred. And yeah. this is the part. So um, I really, I was, I've been working with indigo, indigo for a number of years. And then I had the honor um, of taking a master indigo class with a master indigo dyer, um, Abu Bakar Fofana from Mali. He's half the time in Mali and half the time in France. But in Mali, he actually grows. They grow all the indigo. And I just, I, I wanted to take a class with him for so long. Um, and I was finally able to do it. And he was talking about how sacred in Mali and a lot of, um, the you know West African I mean basically all over Africa but how sacred it is and how um, symbolic it is so when a baby is born they they create cloth and it's all like from the cotton you know from their land and hand spun hand woven they create a cloth and they dye it with indigo and um, they wrap the baby in the cloth and that is for good fortune in their life life. And then when people pass away, they wrap their um, dear ones in indigo to prepare them for the next life and give them great fortune in the next life. And so when I create my indigo vats, again, they're, they're very, very sacred. This indigo, um, I've, I've prayed over it. I stir it every day. I talk to it every day. I ask the angels of my studio to watch over it. Um, 
it's it's just something that is it's living. It's it's living. If you don't if you don't care for it, it will not give you blue. Um, so this is half the battle. Are you? Do you have? Well, I, I the vat that I used to create the vat that you saw in the little clip, that was um, created over a year and a half ago, and it's still giving me beautiful blues. Although yesterday it didn't want to give me blue, so I didn't bring it today. But um, but it's still it, they vats can go from two to three years, but you really have to care for them, and it depends on the temperature. Yeah. So right now, because it's warm, I keep my vats outside, and then I stir them every day. In the winter, I bring them in, I wrap them up in towels, and I keep. I, I, they want to always be warm, but they yeah. can last for like up to three years, and then when they're spent, I. Um, just because they have given me the gift of the color and just I've just the honor of being able to use that when they're done I let them retire and I pour them in my garden and give them to my plants but I never try to revitalize my vats some people do but I don't um, yeah just just we can go do, to Q&A yeah we can go to Q&A if you yes. want Could you talk about how you prepare your vats? Gonna, yes Oh, great. <laughs> there was a question here. Um, can I talk about uh, how I created these vats, which is a good question because I did not pee in it. Um, but, I d but I did add lime and um, I added fructose. So I didn't have, a lot of times I have like overripe bananas and stuff or oranges, which I'll add to the vat because it, it needs the fructose and then it needs the lime for the alkaline yeah. um, levels, um, and you know, and so it's it's basically um, I take the indigo when I get the indigo, it's it's powder, it's an organic indigo, it's um, indigo ferro tinctura, which is this little laurel here, and then um, I grind it, and when I'm grinding it again, it's very meditative. I think, I think certain souls in 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 um in africa abu bakar told me that they thank like the goddess of air and the goddess of water we don't have that in the philippines not i mean i'm filipino catholic and we're weird anyway so we you know like i'm like ask the holy spirit to watch my vat and all of that and i really i i believe it you know and and really 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 truly when you pray over them, and when you treat them so sacredly, they give you the most beautiful blues. And um, I was very fortunate to get the blues that I got for the collection because that vat was really, really prayerful. So then I, I, I grind it, um, and that's very meditative. I don't let any, um, if there are pigments that happen to spill, I re reuse that fabric. I don't, I try to keep everything and have no waste. And then I add, that grinded, it's kind of almost like a pancake mixture at that point um, when it's well grounded. And what we're trying to do at that point is we're trying to um, grind it carefully and not put any oxygen in it because the vat actually cannot have any oxygen, but we need the oxygen to allow the pigments to happen, which is one of the only dyes yeah. that, that does that. And it's also one of the only dyes where we don't have to heat this up yep. and keep it heated to dye it. Um, this is now a little bit like a warm room temperature because it's been outside all day. And then I mix it in um, with the water, with the warm water. I put the lime and I put the fructose and I mix it and it goes in a certain order and there's a certain amount, or there's a ratio for each one. And then I also make sure that I stir it in the same direction and very gently so as to not add oxygen to the vat. So that's basically um, how I created this particular vat. Other questions? Uh oh. <laughs> here, we, here we go. Ray Ray's mom has a question. <laughs> so, um, as you're using dyes, most um, dyers understand that um, cottons and plant materials um, need different dyeing processes than natural fibers from animals. Silk is right in the middle and it'll behave well with either technique. So have you found using the indigo that, um, how does it do with natural animal fibers? 
Oh my goodness, it does beautifully. Um, and yes, you're right. So um, we, you know, these these cloths that you, these panels that you see here, we actually pre-treated them and heated them for about 20 minutes with soda ash because soda ash has a lot of alkaline in it. So we wanted to bring it into this alkaline environment. We didn't want to shock the vat. So they're, they're sort of, it's called mordanting or, or scouring. Um, and with silk, you don't necessarily have to do that, but it does have a protective gum to it that the silkworms you know, create. So we want to get that off of it. Um, with, uh, so it works beautifully if you do that. And also we do that, we make sure to pre-treat these because we want it to be as color fast and light fast as possible. So pre-treating it will give it an integrity that it wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and then also with silk, afterwards, I'll take these and I'll like let them sit in a very weak vinegar water vat um, to bring to kind of neutralize the acid acidity from the alkaline as well. So it's all about it's very science based, and you know people talk about people in the fashion industry and how it's you know I'm sure, I don't have to tell you what people think about people in the fashion industry but um, but there when when you get into the deeper aspects of textiles and processes it's really intense I have a microscope I look at all of my the fibers I get from Laurel under the microscope to see you know where what the scales look like and how they'll felt and will they, they be efficient um, so to answer your question Laurel um, the, the indigo dyes wool beautifully. The, the gown that you saw when you entered today, um, that's dyed with indigo. And the gown that you see in the main room, the gallery room, you'll see parts of that where Ray Ray is actually on that gown. And Ray Ray is an alpaca. Ray Ray is a Surrey alpaca. And the Surrey alpacas have very silky fiber compared to the Wakai alpacas, which we all mostly know the furry, cute you know, furry, although Ray Row is adorable. Um, so they dye really beautifully. And with the, with the alpaca and the wool, um, because I'm felting them, I'm already sort of scouring them and cleaning them. So when they're ready to take the indigo, they take it beautifully. You don't have to use a mordant or anything? Oh, no. No. Pre-soaking or anything? No, no more. Well, yeah, I do. I, it's best to, um, when, whenever you dye, especially indigo because the, the, the air molecules help, which are in water too, right? So it's best to wet it first and then dye it, but I forgot that there's no water in this bucket. So, um, so I just, but you can see it's still beautiful. So it still takes it. But what the whole point is, is just to really try and get the best, the maximum you know, amount of pigment out of your vat um, while still honoring it. And really, sometimes it changes. I mean, this is the same vat, Erin, that we had at the Arts Festival, and it would not give us this blue. No, it was more teal yeah. uh, two weeks ago, three it weeks ago. It was not happy, because we were jostling it, and it just didn't want to. I'm so sorry, little guy. But um, yeah, today it's quite happy for you guys, so it's just giving a beautiful blue. <laughs> Other questions? The sheer fabrics that you have on the display, are those silk, cotton, what, what fiber are they? All of the base fabrics that I use for my pieces that you see, um, let me think for a moment. Yeah, that's true. They're all silk. So they're all, this is a silk gauze and um, it's a combination. I've used a combination of crinkled silk chiffon and silk gauzes. Um, and you can see here that, oh, this is a great example. This is felted using um, local wool, and it even has a little bit of silk fiber in the wool, and it, it took the dye beautifully. So yeah, this is, it's the same as this. They're all that base, um, some type of silk gauzy base to all of them. She asked about my blouse as well. Yes, and that is, that's a crinkled silk chiffon, and that has some felt, oops, some felting up here. And that's been dyed just, a, just maybe twice. Um, and actually, you should, you should dye it some more, Erin. Get it a little darker if you want. I did but, bring um, it on purpose. But sometimes we think of indigo, and we think of these deep blues, and we talk about these blues. But I think one of the most beautiful um, aspects of indigo is the, the gradient that it can create. Sometimes I create with one simple dip. I can get the lightest, lightest, lightest blue from a vat that's almost done, and it is just beautiful. 
And I think sometimes we overlook that very, very light blue that there's still so much beauty in it um, and it doesn't have to be that deep indigo, you know. There were some other hands up. Yes. When you're doing a wax release, a relief, do you have to remove the wax then? And how do you go about doing that? Yes, it's quite simple. Um, you usually, um, you can just put it in warm to hottish water. It depends on your fiber. So with silk, um, I don't, this isn't a process that I've been doing a lot, but I'm moving more and more into it. Um, and so I've had different textilians advise me that with silk, because we don't want to, um, um, di di what is the word in English? We don't want to take away the uh, integrity of the fiber itself, that it's better just to have it in like warmish water, and that will melt all the wax yep. away. And then the wax ends up floating to the top of the water, just and then you scoop it, off. it, and then re yep. reuse it. Mm -hmm. So every, all of the pieces as well in the exhibition, as well as this, is all zero waste, um, because we're able to really reuse um, a lot, and they're, there really isn't waste because I can control how much fabric and um, dye to use. And then a lot of pieces also out there, um, the, the cream one was made using rainwater. So I'm very conscientious about how I use water and, and, and how, um, where I get the water from. So um, that was used with rainwater. Water. And I couldn't dye it because our rainwater is becoming more and more acidic. Yep. And it's starting to change the way I have this book of you know how my recipes and what mm -hmm. the, they look like, and they've just been changing over the years because of acid rain. Yeah, I know it's a little frightening. Yeah. Whenever I'm in the rain now, I just think like, why, you know, there's some acidity in there. Sorry. Uh, so uh, historically, was indigo grown exclusively in Georgia and South Carolina? Or was it elsewhere also? And does anyone grow indigo in the US today? Um, in terms of the American colonies, yes. Uh, they did do a little bit of indigo in the Caribbean. Um, however, uh, they weren't willing to give up the land that was being sown for sugar. Because you were getting uh, the sugar cane had a much higher demand um, because of uh, the rum production and then molasses and, and sugar um, in Europe as well. Uh, so in terms of the upper part of North America, not so much at that period of time. You did have indigo grown more so through um, the southern parts of Central America and into that northern uh, section of South America, um, which is where it was also happening um, uh, naturally. So it was just easier. Uh, I, I think. Um, Oh, I got, distra I got distracted they, on my geography. They do grow indigo. Like yes. There's a big, um, California has yes. huge in indigo crops. And then there's one in, um, in Cleveland now. There's a group of yeah. uh, fiber shed. Yeah, yeah. They've, been, they've had this indigo project. And they've done a great job. They've grown quite a, a few hundred pounds of indigo. It's been incredible. Yeah, it's really good. I think um, it's picking up here now, but generally I think it's still more of like people who are interested in sustainability and more yeah. of a niche market and trying to get out of the, the mass commercialization and possible um, labor exploitation that can happen yeah. um, with growing indigo still to this day uh, in different parts of the world. So it's, it's certainly, it's not anything that's in South Carolina and Georgia now is probably more local to local artists and local cooperatives, as opposed to some of the bigger places that are popping up in California. And there's a place um, called, there's, there's a last plantation that is still growing indigo called Sea Island. Oh yeah. And I've actually gotten seeds from them um, and grown them. Actually last year my crop of indigo was from them. So they're, they're still active. I don't know how big they are. It's not. I don't think it's a big commercial thing, but they're still. I think it's more symbolic than. I it think is. it's more symbolic in education. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Let's make you run. How many plants does it take to make a batch? Oh, that's a really good question. It depends on how strong you want your vat. 
You can make, we can do, um, last year I had three plants that they were, they were quite big and the three plants made a vat and it was quite a weak vat. Um, so I, I would say like, it was a little darker than the, maybe the, it was a weaker vat. It wasn't quite as dark as this. Maybe it was like two shades lighter than this. So it just depends if you want, if you want a deeper indigo, then you of course need more, more plants. It can take quite a lot. Yeah, it could take, yeah, it could take quite a lot. I mean, this has quite, quite a bit of pigment in it, but I don't know how many plants it would have because it's, it, it's all powder form at this point. Hello. So when Hi. you were talking about um, adding the fructose in, um, I was just wondering for some clarification of how you're incorporating it. Like, are you just kind of putting in the fruit peels or are you like getting liquid from them? And I guess another question I have is that plus the lime, how does that compare to when people were traditionally like adding in urine or possibly other things to, you know, make this whole process happen? Yeah, I think, um, I think that, I don't, I mean, I think Marlise, you, I think you can add to this as well, but historically they think indigo was um, accidentally discovered because they were like near urinals. Yeah. And so because they were, there was urine, right, and they were near urinals and then they were near, and then they were throwing out their rubbish. So there were like fruit scraps and stuff like that. So they accidentally almost like they had the fructose and then the, the, the alkaline, right? Um, so um, I think it depends on who you asked. And I think from country to country, yeah. we all do it differently. In Japan, they add sake. And then the Philippines um, will add our own type of rice wine up north in the northern region. So with, with, to answer the question about adding the fructose, yeah, I'll just like cut up the old bananas and the old, and I'll stick them in. And, because every day, even if it's sloshy, every day you're, you're, you're mixing it and every day you're processing it so it will break down. And that, that breakdown is what, you know, breaking it down is what, what you want. Yeah. Um, and the lime is, it, it just takes the place of the urine that yeah. was used. Essentially, it, it functions the same. It's just sort of you're getting that chemical reaction from something else. So before you start, you know, you know the urine sort of predates the ability to sort of mine and, and manufacture that lime. And it was easier and closer and cheaper. So um, use what you got. Uh, so, it, but at the, at the base chemical level of how that chemical reaction is happening, it's the same. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, it, and some people, like this was very um, recipied because I'm, I'm very particular, but I'm gonna start to explore changing that and seeing what works for me. And when you go see like, like Abu Bakar, he has a different way. and you know, of the proportions that he uses. And then when you go to Japan, yeah. they, they look like they're just dumping stuff in to me because um, their vats are so big they're in the huge. ground. Yeah, oh, yeah. They're so big. And they're just like pouring a whole bottle of sake in there. And they're just like, yeah, he loves, she loves sake. But so I, it's, it's a fascinating process. Um, It's interesting because it gets a little tricky when you in introduce stretch. You're doing that with a man-made synthetic fiber that's petroleum-based, so you're talking about your polyesters and your spandexes, right? But what about the old denim? Like, that's 100% cotton. Railroad, you know, that's 100% cotton. Yeah. That stuff's easy. That stuff's like... Mass produced, because those are huge jackets and huge denims. The vats for that are absolutely enormous. Yeah. Absolutely enormous. Um, and you're talking about... They're usually at that point they're dyeing the fabric in in yardage. They're not dyeing the finished piece. Okay. So that's how you get that done. Yeah. You're gonna move it. So instead of dyeing the finished piece, you're dyeing the fabric and then using that and cutting it up. Um, and you're dyeing, I mean, absolutely room sized vats. Yeah. And also yarn. Yarn so, too. So uh, denim is created using a twill weave. So when you look closely at your denim, the weave looks mm -hmm. what is it called? What is it? Diagonal. I'm sorry, my English is off today. Um, and so the, the, it's a warp, uh, warp face weave. So basically, you know, like usually 
Usually here, these, these uh, white uh, yarns are the warp. And then this is a weft, so this is coming in and out, in and out with the ecot yarn. Um, denim is the other way around. We see yeah. more of the warp than we see of the weft. But the, um, the weft is, is white mm -hmm. yarn, and then the warp is this indigo dyed yarn. So that's why you cannot get the effect um, with anything else than we get with blue jeans because when our blue jeans start to wear out you start to see some of the white yeah. yeah but it's not so distinct right it's still blended in because those are all of the um, the the weft yarns that are kind of coming through and you notice if you get a tear in your jeans the white yarns start coming out so a lot of the dead and that's the that's the effect that's what we call like the denim effect and that's also where they put the stretch yarn they put it, they wrap it, they use the cotton. So you have like a stretch core, because it's a filament like a fishing line. You wrap that in cotton and then you weave with it. And you weave it in that horizontal so you don't have to dye it. And the fabric existed long, like they oh, say yeah. it was from France, the yeah. Nîmes, the, Nîmes. The, the, the area Nîmes in France. So that's where de Nîmes, and then we dropped the E when it came to the States and we call it denim. We Americanize that thing. Yes. I can see you probably hear me from here. Well, but, but, but we're recording, but, so but I'm wait. trying to catch your Wait. Wait. <laughs> well, thank you for your presentation. That oh, thank you for being here. You are depressing me with the slavery <laughs> stuff. All That's what I'm here for. Stuff There's depressing. nothing I love more than ruining the romance of history. <laughs> I don't even. I haven't even talked about what history smelled like. Girl, You're fine. It's painful. <laughs> but, uh, are you familiar with uh, the pole wrapping shibori techniques? Yes, the we Arashi. tried to do. We tried to do a mini version of it. <laughs> okay, the arashi and bomaki. Whenever I've wrapped it around the mm -hmm. pole, the part of the fabric that touches the pole first is the part that doesn't get dyed as much, and it yeah. bugs me to death. So I'm wrapping and wrapping and wrapping, but the outside gets the Die. Is there a trick to that to get it more even? Well, if, you, um, if you're wrapping it, um, that makes it hard. So when you, when you wrap it, you, you want to wrap it as flat as you can. You're probably using PVC. Yes. You're wrapping it around PVC. So you want to wrap it as flat as you can, and then you scrunch it, and then you bring the next layer of that long yardage down below. So don't try not to wrap it into itself. Yeah, you're like wrapping it around, like like you're wrapping it here, then you're scrunching, then you're wrapping it here, you're scrunching, you're wrapping it down here. Instead of wrapping it around and then scrunching the whole thing, I find that that gives me better effects and that you don't get that whole white area. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's fun that you do that. <laughs> do you use, do you make your vats? I'm sorry? Do you make your indigo vats? I work with polymer clay. I make jewelry. Oh! Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's really neat. Yeah. I wonder if it'd help if she drilled holes in the PVC to allow the dye to. Yeah, I. That might. I don't know. I have never. Oh, Laurel always comes up with the most, you know, and innovative yeah. stuff. Which um, it might. It could work. Um, I just know that the. I mean, that might work, Laurel. I know that the, when it's, it's tightly wound around something, it's just that resist. But maybe, and then if you did holes, maybe in those areas where the holes are, you'd get more of the dye. Yeah. You can try pattern. it. Yeah, it'll change the yeah. resist pattern, because it's going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. S Celeste, when you grow your, your own indigo, it's me. Um, <laughs> where? What do you do? How do you actually take the plant to get it to the to the, where you put it in the pot. How, how do you do that? What, you know, do you use all of the plant? Do you, do you dry oh. it? Oh, thank you. Is that Marie? It's Marie. <laughs> OK, hi. Hi, hi. Marie. Um, I take the leaves only. And then I, um, uh, I've done a couple of things to try it. But I found that the best way um, was to, to pound them. Um, and so I was pounding them and creating sort of these indigo 
cakes with them and then letting them dry and then using it like that. But you know, there's an, I, there was another thing that I tried, but I only had a few leaves left. And I just took the leaves fresh and put them in iced water. And um, there's something about the icy water and the leaves that brings the pigment out. And it creates a very beautiful aquamarine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And my next, um, I'm, what I'm going to try next is I'm going to try to compost them. It's just that I, I need more plants, which is why laurel is only one of oh. many. Um, but, and I'm going to try composting them next. And um, my dream is to go to Japan. There's a, there's a master indigo grower there. And I'd love to learn his processes to incorporate as well. So, any last uh, last questions for wrap up? Okay, great. Thank you, guys. These questions yeah, are great. great. Question. Yeah, I'm glad I could answer some of them. <laughs> all of them. All of them. So I'm wondering where um, or how you would suggest that uh, we can learn more, particularly here in Columbus, since I'm not in a position yet to go to France. <laughs> um, to study with Abu Bakr, although I read his stuff every day. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what would, suggestions would you have? I wouldn't know. You mean locally? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, like the techniques and how to do it. I mean, I think there's, um, there's the, we have our local fiber shed. We're part, so I don't know if you guys know about fiber shed, but fiber shed started in California by Rebecca Burgess, and she had this idea of using, working within a network um, I think it's like a 500 mile radius, I think, and you're just working with everyone within that, that scope, um, that area, um, which is what I've been trying to practice even smaller and smaller, which is why I love to go to Laurel's farm and get my fiber from her, because it's just creating a smaller carbon footprint. But our, our, so fiber sheds exist in different regions. Our local fiber shed is Rust Belt Fiber Shed. And they're a wonderful resource for um, all of this. They, they worked very closely with the people in Cleveland to create their indigo um, project. And they're doing it again this year. They even have a flax project where they're growing, local farmers are growing flax and, really? cr and processing it and we creating. We used to grow that more here. Yeah, it's, it's Way incredible. Back. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, to make flax makes linen. Yeah. So um, they're making linen fab. So I'd start there, and they're gr and they're wonderful. They're two, tw they're twin sisters, um, who started it, and they're really they're really wonderful people too. So I think we had one. More. I think I, I can speak for everyone. I really appreciate your presentation, both oh, of you. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you. We all have one question in mind. How are you going to clean your hands? <laughs> <laughs> well, as we said earlier, um, indigo is a wonderful insect repellent. And I, mosquitoes love me. They love me. I can't go out too, for a okay. moment without getting bit. So I like to leave, leave my hands. And of course, this event is called Blue Hands, right? Um, and I, one time, I actually showed up to a, a meeting with, these, with my hands really blue. And um, they were like, are your hands always blue? And I was, like, I was like, no, only when I die with indigo are they blue. And they were like, that should be your, the name of your next book, which I don't even have my first book out. <laughs> but, um, so I am kind of, I, I, enjoy, um, I enjoy having them. I, I probably won't wash them for the rest of the night because um, they are, um, it's, it's actually quite not good for your skin, yeah. too. It's, it's a nice. Um, moisturizer for your skin, and it's good for us. Um, and I like to just appreciate my vat. I just am so grateful to my vat, and I'm so grateful to all of you. So um, it's just a little bit of a reminder of this day and, and the vat, too. So I, yeah, I'm sure my husband will just be like, can you just wash your hands? <laughs> but. It's awesome. Well, I want to thank all of you for, um, again, for coming. Uh, I, I, you said it before, Celeste, but I forgot that your last name means blue, and as does mine. No, my first name. Oh, your first name is Celeste, blue. Okay. Celeste is blue, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm blue. I know. And you're wearing blue. I try to be on theme. And Worthington is blue, which is why, you know, we were just like, well, you need to come to the MAC and be blue with us. So, um, uh, so again, thank you all so much. We have been so... 
blessed to have really amazing experiences with Celeste during this exhibition and are looking forward to continuing this great relationship and great programs moving forward with you. And uh, now we know who to call on when we need some other um, fashion advice from uh, the <laughs> corset days. Um, oh, any days, but those are the fun ones. Those are the fun ones, yes. Um, but um, thanks again for coming and uh, uh, I don't know, tip your bartenders or whatever that is. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody. Thank you.